Now, today is prayer and fasting Sabbath. And um, I will be speaking from the title as displayed on our screens, Turning the Tide. This forms the basis of something the Lord has impressed upon me to do. And um, as a church, we have done well in so many programs and service of the church. But in the days I've been out, the Lord has been talking to me so much about the subject of prayer. And he pressed upon me to lead my church into a very intentional, structured prayer life. I appreciate we pray, but we can do more and better. Now, for us to be able to achieve that, I have spoken to my colleague pastors, and starting from this about going all the way to the end of the year, we will change the structure of our summons to lead and converge into causing a revival um, within the membership through prayer and Christian growth. As we check in our program for this, the other theme, and where we are in this last uh, quarter, which is the first number today, the quarter is about growing in Christ. And so prayer is one of the key things that will help us to stay at the feet of Christ that we may grow. Uh, learning from him. Now, I have also put up a program that will be running every morning. I had requested the, you know, the PA team to project that one. Um, we, I seek to have a program that will be running every morning, the prayer session every morning. Um, that program is titled, Ignite Your Day. Ignite Your Day. And basically, we want to have a moment every single day from 5.30 in the morning to 6.10. Every morning, four minutes of being before the Lord. Just begin the day with the Lord. Don't get strengthened from the Lord. As you go about your business in your office, you know, are very busy people in the city and elsewhere, we need, you can just spend four minutes with the Lord. Just talking and refilling yourself. And um, I have lined up the series of the messages that we are going to help us run through this from tomorrow morning. So I want to invite all of you tomorrow morning, 5.30, going to 6.10. It will be virtual, and we are going to share the Zoom link, especially those the church, um, WhatsApp groups, and also on our church website for anyone connecting that they may be able to join. And uh, we, I am praying that you join me in prayer. I love morning sleep, but the Lord has smoked me out of that sleep. And so I want you to pray for me so that every morning I will have strength to wake and share together with us and invite you to connect to that platform as we ignite our day. So far, the Lord has helped me to put together every morning message starting from today tomorrow, all the way to seven months, as I'm talking to you. Everything is set every single day. The seventh month, I have that series ready for you. And that tells you why I was a bit quiet. You're asking, Pastor, where are you? That's what I was doing when I was quiet out there. So I want to invite you in a very special way to ignite your day every single day, starting tomorrow from 5.30 to 6.10. Now, to start off this is... The message that we share today, turning the tide. What did I say? Turning the tide. And I chose this uh, message, this topic, in line with what we intend to be doing uh, every morning because I know something that you are not be used to, and it takes a while for you to align yourself. And so it's a mountain for some of us, but we have to surmount the mountain. And so turning the tide. It's based on the text of Ephesians chapter 6, 
We'll read from verse number 12 down to verse number 20, though I'll lay emphasis on a few of those verses. So come with me to the book of Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 12 down to verse number 20. The word of God says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the old armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having guarded your waist with the truth, having put on the best breastplate of righteousness, and having showed your feet with preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints and for me, that entrance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Turning the tide. Let's pray. Our gracious Father in heaven, hallowed be the name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in this place and for this message as it is in heaven. For thine is the kingdom, is the power and glory. You said, if you be lifted up, you shall draw all men unto yourself. And so, my Father, I recognize that this is not my moment, this is your time. I pray, my Father, that I may not be seen, but you may be seen. My request, Father, is that you may put us into my mouth. And order my lips and my thoughts to your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Turning the tide. Imagine being in a small boat in the middle of a vast ocean. So the waves are towering like mountains. Crashing relentlessly against you. And every breath feels like it could be your last as the boat is tossed here and there. Giants are the billows of the storms. And so fear grips your heart. The horizon looks green. And survival seems impossible. But then in that situation of despair and desperation, suddenly something miraculously happens. Out of nowhere, the tide begins to change. The once roaring waves start to calm. The winds ease. And the skies begin to clear. Rays of sunlight pierce through the thick storm clouds. And peace begins to settle over the waters. In that moment, you realize that something profound is happening. What was once seemed like an unstoppable force of storms has become overcome. The tide has turned. Calmness has been restored. Peace has reigned. Friends, that brief illustration explains most of our moments in life. We often face situations where the tide of life seems to turn against us. 
whether it's personal struggles, challenges in church, or spiritual dryness in your experience or in our communities. At times, it feels like we are being swept away by torrents of this life, difficulties of this life, doubt, fear, even fear of defeat. Storms seem likely to overwhelm us and swallow us in the toilet. But just as we put our thoughts and stay them in the Lord, just like the ocean storms that fade away, being controlled by the powers and agencies of heaven, God has a way of speaking to the storms of our lives and make them come that we may have hope and especially when in the hour of prayer. This morning, friends, I'm here to remind my church that as we go through many storms of life, God has given us a powerful weapon that is able to turn every tide that comes your way. God has given us a weapon that if you use it, you will have power and ability to turn the tides in your life away and you shall have peace and strength for every single day. That weapon is prayer. Is somebody with me? That weapon is prayer. You see, friends, through prayer, we invite God's divine intervention that changes the course of events. Through prayer, we invite God's divine intervention that brings breakthroughs that otherwise would be impossible and would destroy us. Today's message, we look at how prayer has the power to turn the tide in our lives and how we as believers can stand strong in prayer to see God's transforming power at work. You see, Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 12 through to verse number 20, is a part of many verses that begins from chapter 1 of the book of Ephesians where Paul is contrasting the power that is in believers when they live in the spirit. And so in verse number 12, Paul says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world and against the spiritual forces or the, the spiritual wickedness in high places. And so Paul introduces this idea and he, he brings this vividly to us with the concept of wrestling. He says, for we wrestle not. You see, friends, wrestling is very significant when we talk about turning the tide as we are faced with this confrontation, this conflict, this battle of life. Wrestling is intense, personal, close quarters struggle. It implies that the spiritual battle we face is not distant or abstract. It is personal and direct to you. This imagery brings to mind a struggle that is up close and requires vigilance, agility, and persistence. You know, something that is coming to go. This wrestling is here to stay. You can't assume it. You can't wish it away. Neither can you use yesterday's victory for today's battle. It is here for, with us. It is constantly with us. We've got to be vigilant. We've got to be agile. We've got to be persistent because we are involved in a serious combat, but not in a physical realm, but in a spiritual realm. Believers are not merely passive of servers in this 
battle. We are actively involved in this fight. This is here with us. And so Paul says, I have carefully studied what is happening in our lives. And I have seen that we have a battle that we are fighting that is very unique. Now, we are not fighting against the flesh and the blood. In other words, this particular fight, this particular battle, this particular confrontation is not physical. No, no. Paul says, I'm rather have this be a physical battle because we know how to fight. Some of us, we have gone to, you know, uh, we've been training how to fight. We have done karate. We have done taekwondo. We have done all those things. Some of us are very good in fighting. But then Paul says, you know, come on, guys. This is not the kind of a battle that you're fighting. You know, some of us are trained in military. We can use serious, sophisticated, you know, instrument and, you know, of war to fight. But this is not the battle we're fighting. We are not wrestling with flesh and blood, but we are fighting with the principalities and with the powers and with the rulers of the darkness of the world. And he says, now this particular principalities and the powers and the rulers of the kingdom of darkness are not in the physical realm. They are in the spiritual realm. He calls them the spiritual forces, the spiritual weakness that does not operate in the physical realm but in the heavenly places. Now, when Paul talks about the heavenly places, he does not intimate in heaven. Now, to mean the heavenly places does not mean they are fighting in heaven. No, no. They are fighting in a spiritual realm where you can't get in your physical nature. You've got to take yourself to be able to go to the spiritual realm and see how they are fighting. See your enemy, see their gadget and the equipment that then you can prepare to fight. And Paul says, this battle is serious, is intense and dangerous because we are disadvantaged. There's somebody with me. You see, he says that the enemy is unseen. If it was by flesh and blood, then we wouldn't see the enemy. Now, not because, you know, the flesh is not by blood. It means it is not a human being that you are fighting with. No, 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 no. You are fighting with forces. You are fighting with forces. You can see forces. You can feel the impact of forces. He says you are disadvantaged because the enemy can see you, but you can see him. Is somebody with me this morning? You are disadvantaged. The reason why you need to be careful as you walk on this journey is because the enemy that you are fighting with is able to see you, but you can see him. I'm just talking about turning the tide. You see, friends, Paul identifies the leaders, the, the, the captains, the commanders of those spiritual forces. He calls them the rulers and authorities. You see, Paul describes the spiritual hierarchy of evil forces and refers to the spiritual hierarchy, the, 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 spiritual, the, the hierarchy of spiritual forces of darkness in the language that was so well used to define or to explain the government structures. You know, he's suggesting, you know, the, the, the military forces that are well organized and they have their commanders and their, their structures put in place. And he says, the enemy is organized. The enemy is organized. He is not upset. He is organized. And he operates with a certain level of power and control. You see, let me, let me speak to my church this morning and let us know, friends. When we go to sleep and we think everything is okay, our enemy does not sleep. He is constantly at war. 
He is organizing and reorganizing, strategizing and re-strategizing on how to attack, destroy. This is what Paul is speaking to us this morning, that the enemy is organized. The armies are organized. They operate with levels of certain power and control. You see, the ancient times, where Paul draws this kind of a, a, an imagery, is that the government of the day and the judiciary system of the day, they used to be very well organized. And so Paul picks that one to let the church see that we are not just dealing with boys. We are dealing with a serious guy who is well equipped, experienced, and sophisticated. But then he is not operating in the physical realm. And I post here when I was going through this message, I asked, is God unfair? Is God unfair? You see, I think it is quite unfair. <clears throat> it's unfair to put a blind man in the same ring with a man who sees and they want to compete. I think it's unfair. I don't know what to think about it, but I feel it's unfair. And I don't imagine what magic the blind man will use? I mean, if, 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 if you don't know how to fight and you're fighting a blind man, how can you lose that battle? You see, Paul says, hey, hey guys, be careful. Be, be, be careful. We are not wrestling with flesh against the flesh and blood. We are not fighting the people we see. There is one behind the people we see. You're not fighting your brother. It is not your spouse. It is not your tribe mate. It is not your president. It is not the people you see. No, 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 no. There is somebody behind those people that you can see. You see, I was troubled when I was imagining, it's God unfair. But then I stumbled on a text that gave me comfort. And I am here this morning to let you know we are, it's not unfair again. <clears throat> because God has something for every Christian. Now, when you go to chapter 1 of the same book of Ephesians, <clears throat> verse number 18, the Bible says, <clears throat> so my throat is struggling. <clears throat> but don't you be worried. <clears throat> we'll go through. Now just check verse 18 of chapter 1. <clears throat> the Bible says, <clears throat> this Paul, I ask that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know the hope of his calling, the riches of his glor glorious inheritance in the saints, and the surpassing greatness of his power to us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of his mighty strength. But I was just interested in the first line there. <clears throat> As I ask, I ask that the eyes of your heart may be opened. Let me repeat it again. I ask that the eyes of your heart may be opened. Pause. No, I was like, oh. Our hearts have eyes. Hmm. I thought we have two eyes. I didn't know that we have three eyes. We have the two eyes that we use to see, but we have a third eye. And allow me this morning, friends, to talk about the third eye. Now, Paul says, every Christian has a third eye. Is somebody with me? He says, this third eye stays in the heart. No, no, no. Is this battle unfair? No, the battle is not unfair. Are we in the ring with people who can see and we are blind? No, 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 no. We are not blind because we have a third eye. No, the two eyes you see, these are to help you to fight against the flesh and the blood. But the eye of the heart is put there to help you fight the battle in the spiritual realm. Is somebody with me? Oh, <clears throat> 
Just say, Past, God, have mercy on pastor. That, that boys may stay until you come to the end. <clears throat> so the third eye, the third eye, the two eyes are for the flesh and blood, but the third eye of the heart is for the spiritual battle. And the physical eyes operate in every places, but the spiritual eye operate in heavenly places. The physical eyes are for the flesh and the blood. The spiritual eye are for the principalities, the powers, the rulers of the kingdom of darkness. The physical eyes are here to help you walk on this earth. The spiritual eye are to help you walk in the heavenly places. And Paul says, I pray for you that your third eye may be opened as you walk into the ring, as you walk into the battlefield. When you're going to fight, not with the flesh and the blood, you've got to activate the eye of your heart that you can see the enemy. Can somebody say amen? This is my prayer. You see, friends, I carefully looked at this passage. And I saw Jesus speaking of the same while he was addressing the problem of the Rhodesian church in Revelation chapter 3, verse 18 to 19. Now, Jesus says through John, talking about the church of the last day, says, you say, I am rich, I have grown wealthy, and need nothing, but you do not realize that you are wretched, faithful, poor, and Blind. Mm. How is that possible? Am I blind and I can see? So which of my eyes are blind? Is it the two physical eyes or the third eye of the heart? And I think Jesus is talking about the third eye of the heart. That Peter says, I pray that the eye of your heart may be opened, that you may be able to see the hope of your calling, that you may be able to see the surpassing greatness of the power of God in believers. When your eye of the heart is opened, that you will know, he says, that you are naked, that you can come to me. He says, Consol I console you to, to, to come to me and buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich, wet garments so that you may be clothed in your shameful nakedness and exposed and serve or ointment to anoint your eyes so that you may see. The problem that we are faced with in this battle is that we are fighting when we are blind. I don't know what comes into your mind. But I saw this is a great pity for the Lodatian church. The blind fighters. Blind fighters. A pack of blind fighters. Could it be that even as I speak to you this morning, I am speaking to a pack of blind fighters. Could it be that Paul knows that even as we come to church to worship, Paul is stuck into a church that is alive and worshiping and serving the Lord, but tells them, I see you are blind. Even as you sing, you are blind. Even as you give your offering, you are blind. I want you to know it is important for you to go to a space where your eye or the heart can be open, that you can be able to fight because the battle is not against the flesh and blood, but it's of the spiritual nature. Can somebody say amen? Let me speak here, friends, and say... <clears throat> We may gloat in our accomplishments, in our name, in our status, in our offerings, in our programs, in our big offering, in our professions, in our, the experience of serving the Lord for so many years. But the question remains, is your that eye active? Is your that eye seen? Is your third eye opened? 
You see, friends, even the blind can sing. Even the blind can give offerings. Even the blind can return tithes. Even the blind can build big houses. Even the blind can drive big cars. Even the blind can be professionals and be mighty people in the society. I mean, so many things that you do when you are able to see, even the blind can do. But I find there's one thing, the blind are completely disadvantaged when it comes to fight. You go to classes with the blind people, they will get first class honors. They are blind, but they are not stupid. Okay? They can do what you can do. But when it comes to war, when it comes to fighting, they are disadvantaged. No, Paul says, we are standing on a disadvantaged platform. Now, he says, therefore, in verse number 13, put up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Put on the armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Now Paul says, because of the nature of the battle, because of the nature of this fight, because of the nature of the conflict, there are some things you need to do. Just like any other person who is fighting, just like any military forces, they will never go to fight without proper dress code. They must put on good armor as they go to fight. It says, put on, round your waist with the truth. Guard yourself with the truth. Get, go to the breastplate and put righteousness there. Go to the feet and put on the shoes of God's power peace. Go to your faith. And have it as a shield in your battle. Go to the head and put a helmet of salvation. Go and pick the sword of the spirit. Then you go to fight. But then it says, but this is not yet. This is not what will make you fight and succeed. This is for your protection. There is something that you need to do. So that you can succeed and be victorious and win the battle. Don't focus on the armor of God. And you know, many times when we read this passage, we all quickly go and settle on the armor of God. And we preach about the armor of God. But I discovered Paul is not emphasizing on the armor of God. Paul is emphasizing something special that he captures in verse 18. Now go there with me. Verse 18, now Paul says, fine, you put on the armor. You are well dressed, you look like a military man. But you know what? You are blind. You are blind. You are not fit to go into the field when you're blind. The armor that you're putting is useless when you're blind. And I want you to visualize in your mind that this Pastor Nyaga here is dressed in a compact suit, but he is blind. Are you with me? He is, I am blind. And, 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 and I am the one supposed to lead in the battle. Let me tell you, it doesn't matter how much you protect that soldier. If he is blind, you are destined to terribly fail in that fight. Now Paul says, with that arm I've given you, Pause there and wait for what is important in your life. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. When you put on the arm of God, then begin praying. Begin praying. Begin praying. Begin praying. Begin praying. Begin praying because the prayer has the power to open the eye of the heart. Is somebody with me this morning? It is the prayer only that can activate the eye of the heart. Remember, the battle is not physical. You've got to pierce through the spiritual realm and see the enemy. Paul says the physical armory is not important. That just for protection. They will destroy you because you are blind. Go to the opening of the eye. The opening of the eye is by praying. Says, 
This prayer is a different prayer. And I love the way it says, pray with all prayers. Hallelujah, somebody. Praying with how many prayers? All prayers. Where? In the spirit. Mm. Praying with all prayers in the spirit. It is in the spirit that the eye of the heart is open. Not any prayer that opens the eye of the heart. We are praying. We pray every day. We pray for food. We pray as we sleep. We pray for weddings. We pray for prosperity. We pray. We are praying people. But how many of us have been to the spirit room? Where Paul says pray in the spirit that your eye can be opened. You know, there's a day. Jesus was, I'm just talking about praying in the spirit. There's a day Jesus was up in the mountain. He was being transfigured. Are you, are you there? Do you remember that story? So up in the mountain, he's being transfigured. Down the foot of the mountain, his disciples, the nine disciples, you know, you're taking three disciples. The nine disciples are down here on the mountain, and something is happening down on the mountain. Aha. Uh-huh. Now, Paul says that you may be able you know, there's something called an evil day. Hey, uh, that you may be able to, to withstand in the evil day. And let me say here that every Christian has an evil day. Every one of us, we have an evil day that you never expect, and boom, it comes and it takes you off guard. No, no, Jesus is on the mountain, and the disciples are down here on the plain. They are there, but boom, an evil day comes to them. Um, a, a person brings a child. The child is demon possessed, and the disciples must cast away the demon. They try praying, the demon can move. They try and praying, the demon can move. Until Jesus comes down from the mountain, he comes down the valley, and he meets a confrontation between his disciples and a demonic case. And then they are so frustrated. Well, it took just a few seconds for Jesus to speak to the demon and the child was healed. Can somebody say amen? Now, this was shocking. Now, when they retreated, the disciples asked Jesus, but, 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 but why were we not able? But, but we, we were praying. We, we were praying. How come that our prayer did not move the demon? Uh, Jesus looks at them and tells them, because of your unbelief. Uh-huh. And I also want you to know the second thing, that for such like this, uh, c- cannot go only by, by, only by prayer and by f- fasting. No, wait, wait. Were disciples not praying? They were praying. You can't cast demons without praying. So what does Jesus mean? You see, the disciples were fighting like they were fighting against the flesh and the blood. They were not in the spirit. They were in flesh. In fact, when I was reading Ellen, she would comment on this. She says, you know, when Jesus appointed the three to go up the mountain with him, the nine disciples were so much annoyed. They were so much angered. They were left there questioning themselves, you know, and beginning asking themselves, who will be greatest in his kingdom? No, no, no. When Jesus is not answer that question, boom, he picks three. And he walks with them to the mountain. But a very special day for Jesus. He says, ah, Kumbe, this is how Jesus looks like. He is not a good guy. What method did he use in pointing out Peter, John, and James? He is not a good guy. What criteria did he use to pick this? But that one is a kiss. But that one is a luo. No, no, that one is a meru. Why, why me come back? Why, why, what criteria? No, no, they were fighting in their minds. They were filled with the flesh and the blood. They were fighting. They were fighting Jesus, calling Jesus' names, talking bad about him. Boom, an evil day comes to them. The demon case. They can't manage. But Jesus is coming from the mountain. On the mountain, Jesus was in the spirit room. Can somebody say amen? Jesus was being glorified on the mountain. He was praying in the spirit. And as he was in the spirit, he saw what was happening down on the valley. He comes and, shh, demon, you, you just go. You just go. 
Uh, uh, and the demon goes. And then Jesus says, okay, come, come to me, come to me. They go aside and they ask him, but, but, but why are we not able to say? And the, the problem is, you're, you're, you're operating from physical. <clears throat> no, no, I want to teach you today and tell you, it is not every prayer that turns the tide. Too many of us are frustrated prayers. We are pr frustrated prayer. We call ourselves prayer warriors. We have been praying and it's not moving. From January to December, you praying over this one thing, nothing changes from January to December. Year in, year out, nothing changes. You are perhaps operating from physical. There are some things you need to move from physical to the spiritual realm. Can somebody say amen? Paul says that's where we need to go. Praying in the spirit means transposing your prayer life. Praying in the spirit to turn the tide in your life. You must master how to transpose your prayer life. Transpose your prayer life is just moving from the mere prayer room where we meet and kneel and pray for food, meet and hold our hands and pray because it's a church program where we need to work and pray because we are sick. We are praying for sickness to go because we have lost our job. We are praying for job to come. You know, too many of us, we are using prayer as a painkiller. Painkiller. Today is a headache. You go, you pull a painkiller. You swallow. The headache goes. The next day is a stomachache. You go, you pull, you take a painkiller. You take, you say, I'm okay. No, 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 no. Prayer is not a painkiller. Prayer is the food for the soul. Can somebody say, man, this is what you need to feed in every day that you may be strong. That when the evil day comes, the evil day comes and meets a prepared gentleman. Can somebody say, man, Jesus says, I need you to master how to turn the times in your life because the times will keep on coming, but I've given you the power and I've been to turn the tide. This one only happens in the spirit room. Praying always with all prayers in the spirit. Can somebody say amen? You see, friends, while you are in the spirit, things change. Hallelujah, somebody. While you find yourself in the spirit, when you are praying in the spirit, things change. Hmm. You see, Paul, in chapter 4 of the same book of Ephesians, but the Ephesians is rich. As if there's a book I, 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 can, I, can, I can recommend to any Christian who is desirous of having a true revival, carefully study the book of Ephesians. You see, Paul says in chapter 4, verse number that and that one, are not giving the Holy Spirit of God in whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Mm, that's, that's that one. But get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, outcry, and slander, along with every form of malaise. Now, look at this passage carefully. Now, Paul says here, do not grieve the spirit. Then he goes on to list things that you keep in your heart. So that even when you are praying, the spirit is not with you. Because you have grieved the spirit. And so Paul kind of saying, for you to pray always in the spirit, you must first do away with what keeps the spirit away from your life. He talks about bitterness. How many of us go to pray and deep in our heart we are so bitter of some people? You're kneeling down. I, 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 I was talking to a friend uh, uh, last week uh, and he told me, Pastor, now I'm praying for this one thing. This guy. This guy. Pastor, I'm praying for God to strike him dead. And I listened to him. I sympathize with him. You honestly go kneel down before the Lord and say, God, <laughs> and you're expecting God to do that. Your heart is, is drossed with bitterness 
No, no, the, the Spirit of God cannot stay in a heart that is so bitter. Yeah, the power of the range. You, you have a hatred. There are some people here, somebody wronged you 10 years ago. You still keep it in your heart. We, we, are, we are people who struggle to let go. They say, I'll forgive you, but I'll never forget. Uspita la niyangu. Eh? Uspita la niyangu. Uspita la niyangu. Uspita la niyangu. Uspita la niyangu. Is that forgiveness? And that's a heart to bear before the Lord. Let me speak to you, child of God. You will never make things morph in your life if you go in the room of prayer with a heart that is so full of darkness. Process get rid of bitterness, rage, and anger, outcry, slander along everything that is of a former malice. Remove it. Now, when you remove bitterness and pain and sin and everything in your life, then you are transposing your prayer life to the realm of the spirit. Can somebody say amen? Now God looks at you and he sees a meek servant. He sees an humble person. He sees somebody who understands the theology of Jesus in suffering that when you are slapped on the side, turn the other side. When they are piercing you on the cross, say, God, forgive them, my father, for they do not know what they do. Somebody who understands the vengeance comes from the Lord. You do not have to fight this battle. I will fight it for you. This is the spiritual realm that Christians all to get themselves in. So when you go to pray, you are not complaining. Hallelujah, somebody. When you go to pray, you are not giving God a lecture. When you go to pray, you are not venting and pouring your anger before the Lord. You are rejoicing before the Lord because the Lord is going to fight for you. Turning the tide. Thou say, turning the tide through prayer. Transpose your prayer life. Hallelujah, somebody. Number two, when you get to the, when you get to the Spirit, when you take yourself to the realm of spirit in your prayer life, you will see what people don't see. When you take yourself to the realm of spirit in your prayer, you will see what people don't see. Now, now let me just give a quick illustration because of time. Now, Elisha had a servant called U, Eliezer. And, and, and as they were doing their job, one day they were besieged. Are you with me in that story? I was so terrified. Now the servant of Elijah, when he walked out of their place and he saw the vast army, the enemy that has come to attack them, he went back to the room and told him, oh my Lord, we are doomed. We, 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 we are dying. You know, that is in Second Kings chapter 6. You can see that story. We are doomed. Uh, how, 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 what will we do, my, my Lord? Uh, and, and then the Bible is very interesting. I love, I love the Bible. You know, the Bible says, in verse 16, Elisha told him, do not be afraid. Hallelujah. Do not be. Then verse 17, the Bible says, and Elisha prayed. What prayer? Open his eyes. Hallelujah, somebody. Open his eyes. And the Bible says, the Lord opened the servant's eye and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elijah. Hallelujah, somebody. No question. Did Elijah send a servant to go and see the enemies? Yes. Did he go and see those enemies? Hmm. Did he not bring the report back? He brought. So was he seeing or he was not seeing? Did he have eyes or he didn't have eyes? He had eyes. But then Elijah said, God opened his eyes. Which eye is Elijah referring to? The eye of the spirit that only is able to penetrate through the spiritual realm and see in the world of powers and principalities what is happening there. And the Bible said God opened Elijah's eyes and he was able to see and he saw on the hills the vast host of heaven who have come to rescue them. Can somebody say amen? When you pray in the spirit you see what people don't see. Elijah was seeing the help they have, but a servant was seeing the enemy. I say, go into the prayer room, but transpose and go to the spirit room where you will see 
world people don't see. Number three, in the spirit room, in the prayer, when you transpose your experience with the Lord, you are always walking in the spirit. The spiritual atmosphere will change in your life. Hallelujah, somewhere. Your spiritual atmosphere will change. You see, Romans chapter 8, verse number 26, 27, a very interesting passage here. Now, the Paul says, now, don't you worry. Now, when you come and you begin praying and you transpose your prayer to come into the space of praying in the spirit, even when then you don't know how to pray, you are sorted out. Because we, you are in the spirit. And the spirit prays for us. Can somebody say amen? The spirit intercedes for us with the growth that human cannot speak and understand. The spirit Picture your prayer. You are so weak, you know. Everyone has an evil day. So this is your evil day. You are so weak even to pray. I don't know whether you've been there before. When you can't even wait to pray. You, 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 you are just there. You, 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 your spirit is choked. You, you are feeling no strength. You are feeling your prayers not going anywhere. Now that time, if you have been walking with the spirit and praying in the spirit, the spirit picks your concerns. Hallelujah, somebody. The spirit sees how much your prayers are crooked uh, and he takes the prayers and he pan your beats them. The, the, the spirit of God pan your beats your prayers and then he aligns them with God's will. He aligns them with God's will. Then he takes them on your behalf to the Lord. And when God sees the, the prayer that has been entertained, that has been, mm, um, what, what do you call it? What do you call it? What do you, yeah? hmm? what, what do you call it? Yeah? What, what do you call it? No, not editing. Formatted. That's the word. Uh, has been formatted. Uh, that, now, the Holy Spirit formats the prayer of those who pray in the Spirit. Hallelujah, somebody. Now, Paul says he prays and intercedes with us for us before his Father with the groans, with the pains. Now, whenever you operate in the Spirit, there is nothing you ask of in Jesus' name that shall be denied. Hallelujah, somebody. We need to move as a church from the mere prayer life, the programs of prayer, and take ourselves intentionally, deliberately into the space of the Spirit. When you are praying, we are praying in the Spirit. Yes, when you pray in the Spirit, the atmosphere changes. The last point here, when you pray in the Spirit, the prayer, oh, the prayer made in the realm of Spirit shifts the battle. When you pray in the spirit, the prayer shifts the battle. You see, friends, Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, 3 and 4, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Yeah, yeah, we, we are in the flesh. We, we are not in heaven. We, we are down here on earth. But when it comes to war, fighting with the transparencies and with the powers and with the rulers of the, the kingdoms of darkness of this world who operate with intense spiritual forces in every place. Now, when we come to that particular battle, we do not war in flesh, even though we walk in flesh. We war in the spirit. Can somebody say amen? We war in the spirit. You must take yourself to the spirit. And verse number four says, for the weapons of a warfare are not a kernel, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and, a, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Can somebody say amen? We are not to operate from the physical. We have to go and find the spirit room, step in there and begin operating from there. This your time, the tide. But so long as you're operating, using the carnal weapons, hate, tribalism, looking at who is who, what you have in this life, the experience you have in serving the church, that avails nothing. You must be broken before the Spirit of God and absolutely be humble and wait upon the presence of God. You see, friends, when we pray in the Spirit, we invite heavenly artillery into our battles. The world deploys the artillery. 
But it is only when you go and pray in the spirit that heaven deploys. His heavenly artillery is to come. And the Bible tells me when those come, they have one responsibility. They bring down the strongholds. Hallelujah. They pull down the strongholds. They break them. Every argument against you. Now, I, I was reading somewhere and the Bible was telling me, you know, when they come, they attack you. And they come through this door to attack you. They, they, they came. They, they are aiming at you from this door. And you are in the spiritual realm. Don't you be worried. Don't you be worried. The heavenly artillery that are with you shall make them non free through this door by seven doors in fear. Hallelujah. They shall come against you, but they shall flee in seven directions. That's why the man of God says, no weapon that is fashioned against you, thou are going to prosper because you are already in the realm of spirit. And when you are in the spirit room, everything is operating from heaven. You can turn the tide. We are so dry, some of us. We are so dry. But I want to invite you friends into an intentional, personal, deliberate prayer life that is not what you've been doing. But moving yourself from the ordinary. And fashioning a lifestyle of prayer. Jesus gave a parable in the book of Luke. Just to teach the disciples how persistent prayer is important. And he told them as a parable of a widow who was the son. And she kept on going to the king, to the master, to the ruler, every time nagging and nagging, nagging until the king was... No, Jesus was not talking about that. He was talking about the principle of a consistent, persistent prayer life. And its benefit in a Christian life. It is not just... Holding your eyes and praise God, I'm feeling I'm weak. God, strengthen me. That's not what you need when you are wrestling with the unseen forces. You must ask the Lord to open the eye that sees the unseen. Is somebody with me? Because the eyes we have cannot see, but the enemy sees us. So he comes to us. We go to him blindly, but he comes to us with precision. He knows where we are and what to use and how to get because we can't see him. We are glossing in the darkness. But when we go to the spirit of God and our eyes are opened, then we can see not only the vast army of the evil one, but we shall, we shall see the, the vast host of the heavenly angels who are on our side. Can somebody say amen? Paul says, I don't care anymore whether I'm living or I'm dying. I know I'm okay in the Lord. Hallelujah. For me, living is just a benefit God has given me. It's just a privilege. I, if I die, hallelujah, I gain it. I'm not losing. Why? Because I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Hallelujah, somebody. I moved from physical. I'm living in the spiritual realm. I am intertwined with Jesus. When I breathe, I breathe prayer. When I speak, I speak prayer. There is no time I need to go beating myself because something bad is happening. I'm always beating myself constantly because I know the battle is raging. And I am not safe even a single second when I am outside of the ring of the spirit. I am calling my church today. We have done well in so many programs. We are a benchmark in so many things. But I pray that we all may agree with the spirit that we ask the Lord in, in Johnson to lead us to the space of the spirit when we pray, our prayer are answered. Hallelujah, somebody. When the church agrees in the spirit, even the prison doors where Peter was were open without them knowing. When you pray in the spirit as a church, miracles will be wrought in the church. Let me speak to you. We are a giant in the city. But at times we look so weak because we so much depend on our strength because we think we are able until we discover we are not able and we pray our eyes to be open to see and admire to be with the Lord. Hallelujah, somebody. Turning 
the tithe. Now, what is it in your life? What is it in your life? What is it in your life that has been a mountain? What is it in your life that has been so difficult? Now, as you journey through every morning, the seasons of prayer, I will be speaking about so many aspects of prayer and the privileges of prayer because it is very clear in my mind right now that no Christian ought to be defeated. Paul says we are all not conquerors, but more than conquerors in who? In Christ Jesus. No, 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 no church member today should be looking for the pastor, for a pastor to pray for them because they are sick. You have the power to pray for your healing and the healing shall come. No one, members, let me speak to my church. Stop this dependence on your pastors. There is a day your pastor will not come through for you. Pray for yourself. Pray for yourself. I, I, I've gone to school. I've done theology. I've, gone, I've been to very good seminaries. But I can tell you, there's no cause I did that trained me how to pray. It's now this is how you're going to pray. It's only Jesus who did, that is enough, no one goes there. The Spirit of God teaches us how to pray. And that Spirit of God is not a reserve of the clergy, of the pastors, it's deployed upon the body of Christ. Why are you looking at me like, Pastor Marisa went. No, no, you, let me tell you, church, you know, I love you so much. I, by the way, church, I love you so much. And, but as times I say, we struggle a lot. We struggle a lot. That small thing, it breaks our head. People are committing suicide. People are dying. A lot of things are. Let me tell us, we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. We have the power. They activate that power. They walk in the spirit. They pray in the spirit. And the mountains will move. Is there something you want to trust the Lord this morning? Is there a storm in your life you want to entrust the Lord with? I want you to stand. Just stand. And say, Lord, today, I want to begin a new journey. Walking with you in the spirit. Praying to you in the spirit. Because any prayer that is made outside of the spirit is a dry prayer. I'd want to start a journey. You may not know how that is going to happen. But you have a willing heart to begin a journey walking in the spirit and praying in the spirit. Raise up your hand as I pray. Gracious Father in heaven, thank you so much for the privilege of this worship and this prayer moment. As a church, you have impressed me, Lord, to speak to my church. The need for every one of us, right at our homes, in our offices, right here in church, that we may activate the power of prayer. That we may seek the scriptures to find the secret that will be hidden there. And the privileges that comes along to every believer who prays in the spirit. That is for us and we claim it today in Jesus' name. Lord, may you help your church today to know how to transpose our prayer life and pray in the spirit. Lord, I pray that you may teach us how to depend upon you. Because when we pray in the spirit, the atmosphere changes. When we pray in the spirit, we see things that people cannot see. When we pray in the spirit, the battle shifts. Lord, I pray for my church today that everyone may be strengthened in the spirit to be purposeful. Just like Jesus 
We would work every morning to the mountains just to pray that we too shall denounce the morning sleep but crave for the morning moment with you that we will be strengthened and the times and the storms in our lives will be overturned. Bless us with your presence and as we begin a program for so many days coming, ignite your day. The Lord will meet you every morning in that program. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord bless you.